morning, uh, if you have a Bible, if you want to open up to Psalm chapter 15, and again, we'll take about 15 minutes. There's four things I want you to walk away with this morning from this, this, this message. Uh, we're continuing on. In about two weeks, we'll start a new, you know, we'll kind of transition a little bit away from the book of Psalms. We've been in Psalms for 16 weeks. And I remind you guys week after week, when you read the Psalms, some of us love them. Some of us don't really like Psalms. We don't really just get a lot out of it. We don't feel like we connect because the book of Psalms, there's 150 chapters and and. Oftentimes, it's like, it's as if, you know, um, when you read Psalms, it's like you're peering over someone's shoulder and you're reading their personal journals they're writing out, right? And you're reading their journal, their thoughts, and, and God uses their words to speak to us. And, and David, you know, one of the kings uh, of Israel, writes this particular Psalm, Psalm chapter 15, and, and he writes about what God wants from us. He says, hey, what does it look like? Hey, you want to go up into God's presence up to, you know, he talks about this kind of funky language. It's like, oh, you know, who can go into, you know, God's tabernacle, the place where God dwells, and who can be in God's presence? Don't, you can, we're not going to look there because I don't have enough time, but you can write Psalm chapter 27. Write Psalm chapter 27 down. David, at one point in Psalm 27, says, oh, God, the one thing I long for more than anything else in my life is to be in your presence, God. God, I know when I'm in your presence, I'm safe and I'm protected. God, I know when I'm in your presence, I experience you and life and what you have for me. And that's why I long for more than anything else. Psalm chapter 15, David says, hey, there are four things that God wants from you. For those of you who long to be in God's presence, you're going to be like, oh, those are easy things. Well, when you read those four things, guess what? It's not just what God wants for, for, from you, but it's also what God wants from you. So Psalm 15, there's two things. David says, hey, God wants something from you, and here are four things. And David also says, it's both in. This is God, what God wants for you. It's not just from you, but God wants for you. You're like, oh, that's a little bit confusing. Well, I think what David is saying in the psalm is, he's like, oh, only those who are righteous, who are in right relationship with God, and who follow his commandments, only those who are blameless can actually go into God's presence. And then he says, here are four things what a righteous and a blameless person looks like. But guess what? Even if I just obey those four things, it's like, I'll never be righteous and blameless. God wants something from me, but what he wants for me is to realize that righteousness, being in a right relationship with him, never comes. Like, you don't walk away this morning, Macy. Don't walk away this morning thinking, oh, I have to do these four things to go in God's presence, to be in his presence. That's, that's partly true in the sense like, hey, this is what God wants from you, to live a life that glorifies and honors him. But what he wants for you is to realize this will never happen on your own. It only happens through Jesus Christ in a relationship with him. Like, that's what it's all about. Like, you should read this and say, oh, I, I'm, you know, he's going to talk, we're going to talk about our speech and the things that we say. And you should realize, oh, man, I... Dink, man, I am so sinful with the way I talk, with the things that I talk about, how I talk. You know that. You know, there are some sins in Christianity that are not socially acceptable, right? You guys get that, right? Like, we all, we're not naive. There are some sins that are just not socially acceptable. There's a, there's a book called Respectable Sins, you know. And there are certain sins that, you know, it doesn't matter if you, you know, for most Christians, like, one sin that's not socially acceptable is adultery, like, everybody gets that. Like, oh, yeah, don't commit adultery. But gossip? We're all like, oh, well, you know, that's not that big of a deal. And David in this passage is like, no, gossip is a huge deal. And what God wants from you to be in his presence is to watch your words, the things that you say. But what God wants for you is to realize that outside of the power of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit in your life, trouble, you're, you're doomed for disaster. 
you know, this is uh, one of the later slides, Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. These words should be in red, but Jesus is speaking, and he says, I want you to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. This is Jesus, and sometimes in the past I thought, oh, you know, I feel like he's setting me up for failure. Jesus, you want me and Stephen to be perfect? That's what it says. But what I think that Jesus wants us to realize is when he says, I want you to be perfect as your father. And what he wants you, Amanda, to realize is that how many of you just struggle with perfection? Like, you know, you're, like you struggle with feeling like you have to be perfect. Raise your hands. Come really high. I want to see this. All my perfectionists, raise your hand. Okay, I'm going to make you. No, you don't have to stand. Okay. This passage gives us anxiety for those who are perfectionists. But what Jesus is saying is, you know what, Mark? I want you to realize that you can't do this. I'm not setting you up for failure. What I want you to realize is that outside of a relationship with me, you can't be perfect. I'm trying to drive you. Psalm 15 is trying to drive you back to this relationship with Jesus. Now, here are some things that you need to do that are good and wise, and this is what God wants from us. But ultimately, he wants for us, God wants for us to be in relationship with his son. You don't, you don't have to turn there. I don't have it on the screen, but... Write on your notes, Philippians chapter 3, verse 9. Just, I don't, it's not going to be on the screen, but the Apostle Paul is writing, and he says this in Philippians 3, verse 9. He says, I no longer count my own righteousness, you know, like being in a right relationship with God. I no longer count my own righteousness through obeying the law. What we're going to read here, Psalm chapter 15, Paul's like, I don't count my righteousness trying to do all the things that Pastor Brad's just going to tell you to do. Although they're good and they're wise and God wants, this, God wants this from us. Paul says, I become righteous through faith in Christ. Someone say amen. God's way of making us right with him depends on faith. God's not going to make you right with him through trying to do all these things. But it's through faith in Jesus Christ. So when you read these four things, it is something that God wants from you. But God also wants something for you, to trust in Jesus Christ. Now, let me, let me read through this passage here. There's only five verses, so it won't take us long, and you can fill in your notes. Psalm chapter 15, starting in verse 1. Again, David says, right, this guy who wants to be in God's presence more than anything else. He says, who may worship in your sanctuary, Lord? In other words, God, who can go into your presence? Who can experience you? Who can walk with you? God, who can be with you? Who may enter your presence on your holy hill? Because in the Old Testament, that's where they associated God's presence with this one particular place. God, who can do that? And then David says in verse 2, this is who. Those who lead blameless lives, think Matthew 5, 48, be perfect, this is who can experience your presence, God. Those who lead blameless lives and do what is right. They speak the truth. Now he's going to describe it. They speak the truth from sincere hearts. The blameless, those who do what is right, they refuse to gossip or harm their neighbors or speak evil of their friends. Those who are blameless and do what is right, they despise flagrant sinners, and they honor the faithful followers of the Lord. Those who are blameless and pure, righteous, they keep their promises, even when it hurts. Those who are blameless and righteous, they do what is right. They lend money without charging interest, and who cannot be bribed to lie about the innocent. Such people will stand firm forever. People who live like that won't be able to be shaken and tossed about like a wind in the middle of the wave because they have this relationship with their Father in heaven through Jesus Christ. And they'll be able to stand firm forever. Turmoil won't just throw them off their keel and knock them over. So let me explain that again. Four questions that are worth asking these are your fill-ins that I want you to think about this coming week as you think about and meditate on this passage. 
David says again, you know, hey, the blameless, the righteous, those, you know, the, the four questions. Are, and he talks about our words, right, in the very first verses, two and three. And I want you to ask that question, are my words, these are filling in red, are my words, the things that I say, are they helpful or are my words hurtful? Verses two and three, David writes about what God wants for us and from us, and he wants us to caution us about our words. Are they helpful or hurtful? New Testament kind of parallel passage says this, James chapter one, Jesus' brother, if you claim to be religious but you don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. And who can control our tongue? Christianity is not about sin management, about trying to manage our sin, but it's about surrendering our lives to Jesus, saying, Jesus, I know that I can't control my words. I can't control my tongue. So Jesus, I'm asking you through the power of the Holy Spirit, which I don't necessarily understand, but God, I'm asking, I'm surrendering my life to you. I'm surrendering my tongue to you, the things that I say. Help me to be honoring to you. I'm your ambassador. You're making your appeal through me. So I need to be cautious and aware of my tongue. Are my words helpful or are my words hurtful? There's so many passages of Scripture. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29 says, Don't use foul or abusive language, but let everything that you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Also on your notes, kind of thinking a little bit more about our words, I wrote, there is a time and place for critical and harsh words. So I don't want you to walk away thinking, oh, well, what God wants from me is to be cautious with my words and to be helpful and never to be hurtful. But Scripture does talk about a time and a place for being critical and harsh words. There's plenty of passages. And I'll just cite two for you this morning. I won't read them both, but 2 Timothy chapter 4, the Apostle Paul is writing. He writes about this guy named Alexander. He's writing to a young pastor. He says, hey, Timothy, watch out for this guy named Alexander. He was a coppersmith, and he did me a much harm but the Lord will judge him for what he's done. Be careful of him, for he fought against everything that we said. Well, I won't read them here to you, but for reference, you can read Mark chapter 12, verse 38, and Galatians chapter 2, verse 11 through 14. Jesus speaks about the religious leaders in Mark chapter 12 and says that they're hypocrites and they're liars, these people who are supposed to be religious leaders. Galatians chapter 2, Paul talks about Peter in a very, very critical way and talks about him, how he was a hypocrite. I wrote on your notes, before you pass on a negative comment, right, ask yourself, is this true and am I sure? Is this just slander that I'm passing around because it's something I read on the internet? Is this true and am I sure whether or not it's true? Ask yourself that question when you're trying to say, God, this is what you want from me and for me. You want my words to be helpful and not hurtful. But at times there is, it is appropriate for a negative or critical comment or harsh comment. Is this true and am I sure? Is this motivated by hurt or a genuine need to know for someone need, that they need to know this? Plenty of passages of scripture, but you know, Proverbs chapter 10 verse 12 talks about arguments, how they come from hatred. Proverbs chapter 16 verse 28 talks about how a troublemaker stirs up strife. And how gossip separates even the best of friends. Other question I want you to ask, this is all part of the first one, is will this make things, when I say this and repeat this, will this make things better or will this make things worse as I share this with somebody else? Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it coming from a place of hurt and pain in my own life? Is this going to help make things better or is it, I'm gonna, am I going to create more problems? Kind of the proverb that I thought of is Proverbs 26 says, interfering with someone else's argument is as foolish as yanking on a dog's ears, right? A person who's mean-spirited and just not wise. The second question I think in this passage um, that I see that, that David is, is asking us, he's talking about people that we want to emulate in our lives. And I want you to ask this question, are the people in my lives, my heroes, the people that I look up to, are they godly? Or godless. We all should have people in our lives that we look up to. People that we want to follow, that we want to mentor us. 
You know, I have a friend, his name is uh, Pastor Don Fothergill, and he comes and he'll speak here at North Point every once in a while, and he's about 10, 12 years older than me, and, you know, and I specifically have sought Pastor Don out. He's retired now, and, and I would look at him as a mentor to me, someone that I try to kind of follow a little bit of his life and pattern some of my life after he follows, you know, he would say, hey, follow me as I follow Christ. Is there someone in your life that you're looking at that would say, hey, follow me as I follow Jesus? Do they have that kind of an attitude about their life? Are my heroes godly or godless? Verse 4 says, those who despise, those who are blameless and pure are those who despise flagrant sinners and honor the faithful followers of the Lord. Everyone deserves to be treated. I want to kind of balance this again. Everyone deserves to be treated with respect, right? Even those who are flagrant sinners, they still deserve to be treated with respect. Scripture is really clear. Right? Because why? Because you're Christ's ambassadors. As if, it's as if God is making his appeal to, through you. He's calling people back to God through you. You know, look at people who are, are flagrant sinners and like, uh, not give them respect or not treat them with love and kindness. Because God is drawing people back through you. It's like, oh, God is drawing people back to him through me? That's what God's word says. A couple of the questions I wrote underneath that, that aspect, that question about who I look up to. Who do I look up to? Who do I try to emulate? Who would I consider to be my mentor? It's a question you should be asking yourself. Who's mentoring me? You know, signing up for life groups, right? That's a part of that process. The third question I think that you should ask yourself this week when we're talking about, you know, going into God's presence, right? Those who are blameless and pure can go into God's presence. It happens through Jesus Christ. But what God wants from me, he wants from me is to be a person who follows through and keeps my commitments. Verse 4 says, those who keep their promises even when it hurts. It's easy to keep your promises when it doesn't cost you anything. It's easy to keep your promises when it doesn't hurt through the small stuff, the inconvenient stuff, the painful stuff. That's the kind of person that God is looking for. Right? You say you're going to be someplace at a certain time, you show up at that time. You RSVP, yet you know that you have no intention of showing up where you RSVP. I mean, who would do that, right? God is looking for people who are going to be faithful with their words. Just two passages of scripture, but I won't read them all. But again, Jesus is talking, he says, Matthew 5, he says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything beyond that, he says, is a form from the evil one. James chapter 5, verse 12 talks about that a little bit more too. Last question that I want you to think about this week. Again, those who are blameless and pure can ascend to God's presence, his holy hill. Right? Those who are cautious with their words and what they say and those who think about um, being following through with their commitments. And I want you, the last question I want you to ask yourself is, do I help the helpless? At the end of that passage, verse 5 says, those who are blameless and right and righteous, this is what God wants from me. Verse 5 says, those who lend money without charging interests and who cannot be bribed to lie about the innocent. I think what David is talking about then, again, is am I a person who helps the helpless? Or do I take advantage of people simply because I can? Do I really look out to help people who are helpless? Or do I take advantage of people simply because I can? You know, I, I, I forgot where this passage of scripture is, but because I just thought about it, but there's a passage, um, somebody will probably know it, but Scripture says to know, what to, to know what you ought to do and not do it is what? Sin. To know what you ought to do and then not do it is sin. God is looking for a church, a people who will belong to him through the power of the Holy Spirit, follow through with what he's asking for from us. When we do that, Scripture says that we will never be shaken. 
We will not be thrown into turmoil when life throws us off balance. Psalm 15, that's what God is looking for from us, those who are blameless and pure.